Today, the name Vermeer instantly conjures an image of his girl with the pearl earring painting known as the Mona Lisa of the North. The 17th century Dutch master's rendition of an ordinary girl sublimely glancing at the viewer from a mysterious black background with a shining pearl upon her lobe has become a universal icon in the canon of Dutch Golden Age artwork. Vermeer's career was devoted to exploring tender moments of everyday life, documenting the private interior spaces of both mind and environment that epitomized the age of Baroque genre works. Yet his mastery of pigment and light elevated the artist beyond the realm of his contemporaries, providing an inimitable glimpse into the lifestyle of his thriving historical era. Johannes Vermeer was born the, in the mercantile Dutch town of Delft in October 1632 to a middle-class family. His father, Rijnier Jans, was a hard-working cloth weaver turned innkeeper and then art dealer. His mother, Digna Baltus, is thought to have been an illiterate housewife due to her ability to sign only an X in place of her name on her marriage certificate. Despite the painter's popularity during his life, criminality had been a factor in Vermeer's family history. In 1625, before the painter's birth, his father was convicted and acquitted of the manslaughter of a soldier following a brawl at an inn. It has been suggested that the acquittal was granted owing to the familiarity between the assailant and the master painter of the Guild of St. Luke. The painter's maternal grandfather was also arrested and imprisoned for counterfeiting. Little is known about Vermeer's education and apprenticeship. Rainier Jans's activities as an art dealer and connections with local artists most likely influenced Vermeer's decision to train as a painter in the mid-1640s. However, his teachers remain unknown. It has been suggested that the Delft painter Carol Fabritius served as Vermeer's teacher, although this is unlikely, as Fabritius only entered the Guild of St. Luke's a year before Vermeer. Leonard Bremer, Delft's most prominent painter, has also been proposed as Vermeer's teacher. There is documentary evidence that the two artists knew each other and that Bremer supported the young Vermeer. However, there is nothing that states that Bremer served as Vermeer's teacher. In 1653, Vermeer registered as a master painter in the Guild of St. Luke, which allowed him a wealth of opportunities, patrons and connections to advance his career. In the same year, Vermeer married Katharina Bolnes, the daughter of a well-to-do Catholic family in Delft. Despite both sets of parents being resistant to the marriage due to opposing Christian beliefs, the wedding went ahead after Vermeer's conversion to Catholicism. Perhaps in efforts to prove his devotion to his newfound religion and in-laws, Vermeer painted Christ in the house of Martha and Mary, 1654-55, his only known depiction of a biblical narrative. His marriage to Katharina allowed Vermeer to climb the social scale significantly and it is thought that afterwards he even limited the contact he had with his family while living in the house of his formidable mother-in-law.
Christ in the House of Martha and Mary, 1654-1655. Vermeer's earliest known painting is housed in the Musée des Beaux-Arts, Valenciennes. This painting depicts an episode in the life of Jesus that appears only in the Gospel of Luke after the parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, 38-42. Jesus visits the home of the sisters of Lazarus of Bethany, Martha of Bethany and Mary of Bethany, the latter typically conflated in Catholic medieval tradition with Mary Magdalene. According to the Gospel of Luke, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. In the painting, Vermeer depicts the sisters as representing two temperaments, the active and the contemplative. The triangular structure of the work allows us to center our attention on the three figures, whilst Vermeer has given minimal detail to the surrounding background, stressing the importance of the drama enfolding in the center. The pigment analysis of this painting reveals the use of the pigments of the Baroque period such as madder lake, yellow ochre, vermilion, and lead white. Vermeer did not paint the robe of Christ with his usual blue pigment of choice ultramarine, but with a mixture of smalt, indigo, and lead white. St. Praxidis, 1655. This is the second most recently discovered painting that has been attributed to Vermeer. In 1969, two signatures by Vermeer were found on the work, though some scholars still doubt the attribution. It is a copy of a painting with the same title by the Florentine artist Felice Ficciarelli. As with most biographical details of Vermeer's life, it remains unknown where and when Vermeer would have seen Fischerelli's painting. The most obvious difference between the two is that there is no crucifix in the Ferrara work. It is Vermeer's only known close copy of another work. St. Praxedis was a Roman virgin who was honoured for caring for the bodies of Christian martyrs. Vermeer depicts the saint wringing blood from a cloth having just cleaned the body of a martyr. The female figure in the background on the left is most likely the saint's sister, Saint Prudentiana. The painting's provenance before the mid-20th century is unknown. The collector Jacob Rader bought it at a minor auction house in New York in 1943. It first received significant attention as a possible Vermeer when being shown as a part of an exhibition of Florentine Baroque art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 1969. The exhibition catalogue drew attention to the signature Mir 1655, and Michael Kitson, reviewing the exhibition, suggested it could be a genuine Vermeer on the basis of stylistic similarities to Diana and her companions. Following Rader's death, 
also in 1969, it was bought by the art dealer Spencer Samuels, who also believed it to be by Vermeer. The Barbara Piasecka Johnson Collection Foundation bought it from Spencer in 1987. The leading Vermeer scholar Arthur Wheelock subsequently argued the case for the attribution to Vermeer in an article devoted to it in 1986. It was sold at Christie's in London on 8th July 2014 on behalf of the Barbara Piasecka Johnson Collection Foundation. It sold to an unknown buyer for £6,242,500, US dollars at the lower end of the estimated price range of £6 to £8 million. Some art market commentators speculated that doubt about the attribution to Vermeer may have contributed to the relatively low price. From March 2015 it has been on display in the National Museum of Western Art in Tokyo, labelled as attributed to Johannes Vermeer. This appears to be a long-term loan to the museum from a private collector. In a 2023 exhibition catalogue, the Rijksmuseum revealed that Kufi Company has owned the painting since 2014. Diana and her companions. Completed by circa 1655 to 1656, this is the only known mythological painting by Vermeer, which is housed now at the Maritzhuis Museum in The Hague. Although the exact year is unknown, the work may be the earliest painting of the artist still extant, with some art historians placing it before Christ in the house of Martha and Mary, and some after. The painting's solemn mood is unusual for a scene depicting the goddess Diana, and the nymph washing the central figure's feet has captured the attention of critics and historians, both for her activity and contemporary clothing. Rather than directly illustrating one of the dramatic moments in well-known episodes from myths about Diana, the scene shows a woman and her attendants quietly at her toilette. The theme of a woman in a private, reflective moment would grow stronger in Vermeer's paintings as his career progressed. The painting depicts the Greek and Roman goddess Diana, Artemis in ancient Greece, with four of her companions. She wears a loose-fitting yellow dress with an animal skin sash and on her head a diadem with a symbol of the crescent moon. As she sits on a rock, a nymph washes her left foot. Another, behind Diana, sits with her partially bare back to the viewer, the most skin Vermeer shows on a figure in any of his extant paintings. A third nymph, sitting at Diana's left, holds her own left foot with her right hand. A fourth stands in the rear, somewhat apart from the rest of the group and facing them and the viewer at an angle, her eyes cast down, her fists in front of her. A dog sits in the lower left-hand corner near Diana, its back to the viewer as it faces the goddess, her attendants, and, immediately in front of it, a thistle. Except for the woman whose face is completely turned away from the viewer, all of the other faces in the painting are to one degree or another in shadow, including that of the dog. None of the women look at each other, each seemingly absorbed in their own thoughts, a fact which contributes to the solemn mood of the piece. In 1999 2000, when the painting underwent restoration work and was cleaned, 
it was discovered that an area of blue sky in the upper right corner had been added in the 19th century. Numerous reproductions up to that time had included the blue sky. Restorers covered over the patch with foliage to approximate the original image. The canvas had also been trimmed, particularly on the right, where about 15 centimeters was removed. Descriptions of the scene being in a woodland glade, or near the edge of a wood, may rely heavily on the patch of sky erroneously thought to be original to the painting, although light without shadows does fall on the scene from above and to the left, with short shadows forming to the viewer's right. The observation that the scene appeared to be taking place in the gathering dusk may have been influenced by the lighter, but darkening patch of sky contrasted sharply with the dark mass of foliage in the background of the painting, together with the shadows on all the visible faces. The painting is signed on the lower left, on the rock between the thistle and the dog. Vermeer may have been influenced by Jacob van Loo's painting that bears the same title and was completed seven years previously. The Procuress. This is a 1656 oil on canvas painting depicting a scene in a brothel. It can be seen in the Gemälde Galerie Alte Meister in Dresden. It is his first genre painting and shows a scene of contemporary life, an image of mercenary love perhaps in a brothel. It differs from his earlier biblical and mythological scenes. It is one of only three paintings Vermeer signed and dated. The other two are the astronomer and the geographer. In 1696, the painting, being sold on an auction in Amsterdam, was named A Merry Company in a Room. The woman in black, the leering coupler, in a nun's costume, could be the eponymous procuress, while the man to her right, wearing a black beret and a doublet with slashed sleeves, has been identified as a self-portrait of the artist, there is a resemblance with the painter in Vermeer's The Art of Painting. It seems Vermeer was influenced by earlier works on the same subject by Gerard Terborch and the Procuress, circa 1622, by Dirk van Baburen, which was owned by Vermeer's mother-in-law, Maria Thins, and hung in her home. Some critics thought the painting is atypical of Vermeer's style and expression because it lacks the typical light. Peter Swillens wrote in 1950 that if the work was by Vermeer at all, it showed the artist seeking and groping to find a suitable mode of expression. Edward Trouchold wrote ten years before that the temperament of the 24-year-old Vermeer fully emerges for the first time. The jug on the oriental rug is a piece of Westerwald pottery. The kelim thrown over a banister, probably produced in Ushak, covers a third of the painting and shows medallions and leaves. The instrument is probably a cittern. The dark coat with five buttons was added by Vermeer in a later stage. The man in the red jacket, a soldier, is fondling the young woman's breast and dropping a coin into her outstretched hand. According to Benjamin Binstock, this dark and gloomy painting could be understood as a psychological portrait of his adopted family and does not represent a didactic message. Binstock says Vermeer used his family as models. The procuress could be Vermeer's wife, Katharina, and the lewd soldier, her brother, Willem.
A girl asleep, also known as a woman asleep, a woman asleep at table, and a maid asleep, created in 1657, this work is housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and may not be lent elsewhere under the terms of the donor's bequest. The painting depicts a young lady appearing to be asleep, whilst an empty wine glass, apparently having just been finished, is displayed on the table. There is an ambiguous nature to the work, which has puzzled critics for many years. X-rays have revealed that originally a man was standing near the doorway, which Vermeer later decided to paint out, adding to the mystery. Technical examination of the painting revealed a man in the second room and a dog looking at him. According to Lietke, the presence of the dog would have alluded to the sort of impromptu relationships canine suitors strike up on the street. The man and the dog were replaced with a mirror on a far wall, suggesting how the experience of the senses quickly passes, and a chair left at an angle with a pillow on it, possibly signifying indolence, together with a hint of recent company. The idea that she was recently together with someone is reinforced by the wine pitcher, the glass on its side, and the possible presence of a knife and fork on the table. The Chinese bowl with fruit is a symbol of temptation, and for a Vermeer contemporary familiar with the symbolism of Dutch art of the time, the knife and jug lying open-mouthed under a gauzy material would have brought to mind more than social intercourse. The painting was very likely owned by Vermeer's patron, Peter van Rijvan, who also owned the famous milkmaid. The painting was among the large collection of Vermeer works, sold on May 16, 1696, from the estate of Jacob Dicius, 1653-1695. It is widely believed the collection was originally owned by Dicius' father-in-law, Peter Kleis van Ruyven of Delft, as Vermeer's major patron, then passed down to Ruyven's daughter, 1655-1682, who would have left it to Dicius. The work's history from that point is unknown until its ownership by John Waterloo Wilson in Paris after 1873. It was sold on March 14, 1881 in Paris, when the Sedelmeyer Gallery in Paris bought it and sold it later that year to Rodolphe Kahn, also of Paris. Kahn owned the work until 1907. It was sold in 1908 through the Duveen Brothers of London to Benjamin Altman, and it was exhibited in New York in 1909. Altman owned the work until 1913, when it passed into the hands of the Metropolitan Museum of Art as a bequest. Girl reading a letter at an open window. This painting was completed in approximately 1657-1659 and is housed in the Gemelde Gallery in Dresden. For many years, the attribution of the painting was lost, with first Rembrandt and then Peter de Hooch being credited for the work before it was properly identified in 1880. After World War II, the painting was briefly in possession of the Soviet Union. It depicts a young woman reading a letter before an open window in profile. A red drapery hangs over the top of the window glass, 
which has opened inward and which, in its lower right quadrant, reflects her, a tasseled ochre drapery in the foreground left partially closed, masks a quarter of the room in which she stands. The color of the drape reflects the green of the woman's gown and the shades of the fruit tilted in a bowl on the red draped table. On the table beside the bowl, a peach is cut in half, revealing its pit. This use of light may support speculation among art historians that Vermeer used a mechanical optical device such as a double concave lens mounted in a camera obscura to help him achieve realistic light patterns in his paintings. In 1742, Augustus III of Poland, Elector of Saxony, purchased the painting under the mistaken belief that it had been painted by Rembrandt. In 1826, it was misattributed again to Peter de Hooch. It was so labelled when French art critic Théophile Torre Burger came upon it, recognising it as one of the rare works of the Dutch painter and restoring its proper attribution in 1860. Girl reading a letter at an open window was among the paintings rescued from destruction during the bombing of Dresden in World War II. The painting was stored, with other works of art, in a tunnel in Saxon, Switzerland. When the Red Army encountered them, they took them. The Soviets portrayed this as an act of rescue, some others as an act of plunder. Either way, after the death of Joseph Stalin, the Soviets decided in 1955 to return the art to Germany for the purpose of strengthening and furthering the progress of friendship between the Soviet and German peoples. Aggrieved at the thought of losing hundreds of paintings, art historians and museum curators in the Soviet Union suggested that, in acknowledgement for saving and returning the world-famous treasures of the Dresden Gallery, the Germans should perhaps donate to them Girl Reading a Letter at an Open Window and Sleeping Venus by Giorgione. The Germans did not take to the idea, and the painting was returned. Well preserved, it is on display at the Gemalde Galerie in Dresden. X-ray examination of the painting in the 21st century revealed an image on the wall behind the girl. Further work by conservator Christoph Schultzel in 2017 revealed that varnish on that part of the painting differed from the rest of the painting and was clearly applied after Vermeer died. In 2019, it was decided by the Staatliche Kunstsammlung in Dresden to restore the painting to its original composition by Vermeer. The painting of Cupid on the wall behind the girl resembles a painting from Vermeer's own collection of art, a painting by Caesar van Everdingen. The restoration provides an opportunity to reconsider the painting. The painting of Cupid on the wall may suggest that the girl is reading a love letter. Stefan Koja, director of the Gemalde Galerie Alte Meister, Old Masters Picture Gallery, said in a statement that, beyond the superficially amorous context, it is a fundamental statement about the essence of true love. Officer and Laughing Girl. This painting was created circa 1657 
and is now housed in the Frick Collection in New York. It contains a common theme in Dutch painting, which is a girl entertaining her suitor. The main subject is the woman at the center, whose face is illuminated by soft, direct light. She resembles Vermeer's wife, Katharina Bolness, who is believed to have posed for many of his paintings. With X-ray photographs, art historians have determined that Vermeer had originally planned to paint the woman with a large white collar, which would have hidden much of her yellow dress. Also, her cap was later extended to cover all of her hair, drawing more attention to her face and expression. This yellow bodice with braiding appears in many of Vermeer's other portraits. It is called a short and was usually worn as an everyday common dress. Over her dress, the woman wears a blue apron, mostly hidden in the shadows of the table. Blue aprons were common attire at that time because they hid stains well. Art historians have interpreted this to mean that the soldier has surprised the girl with an impromptu visit during her morning chores. The woman holds a wine glass, usually used for white wine. Because at that time wine cost more than beer, it indicates her wealth. The cavalier in the foreground wears a red coat and an expensive hat displaying his wealth and rank. His hat is wide-brimmed and made of beaver pelt, which was weather-resistant and good for snowy and rainy conditions. The pelts for these hats were imported from the New World, in this case probably from New Netherland, present-day eastern United States, which was at the time controlled by the Dutch West India Company. The red in his uniform is associated with power and passion, bringing a passionate and emotional note to the painting. His rank as an officer is indicated by the black sash he wears. His striking presence in the immediate foreground brings drama and depth to the mood of the composition. This artistic device in which an object is placed in the foreground to increase the depth of field of the overall painting is called repoussoir. Caravaggio often used this technique, and Vermeer probably learned it from paintings of Caravaggio's imitators. The nature of the interaction between the woman and the soldier can only be conjectured. Many art historians believe that it only portrays a woman being innocently and honorably courted by this soldier. However, some have suggested that her open hand and smile could indicate a discreet willingness to engage in sex. Officer and Laughing Girl is one of several paintings in which Vermeer depicted maps or globes. The map that hangs on the wall in this painting is identifiable as a Willem Bleu, Balthazar Floris van Birkenrode map of Holland and West Friesland, which Vermeer must have owned, as he used it in three of his paintings. Peter van der Krocht wrote that Vermeer's gift for realism is evidenced by the fact that the wall map, mounted on linen and wooden rods, is identifiable as Bleu's 1621 map. He captures all of its characteristic design, decoration and geographic content. The window and lighting is characteristic of Vermeer's interior paintings, most likely because it is modeled after the room he painted in. This window is extremely similar to the window in The Girl Reading a Letter and Open Window and The Milkmaid. The glass in the window has many variations of color, showing Vermeer's precision in the details of this painting. Only bright light comes in from the window and no outside scene can be observed, as Vermeer never allows the viewer to see the outside world. Some art historians believe that Vermeer used a device called a camera obscura to help him create the perspective in his painting. Instead of using a mathematical formula or a vanishing point, Vermeer probably used this mechanical device to show him what the relative size of the people should be. A camera obscura is similar to a camera as it projects an image seen through the aperture into a dark chamber. 
There is no historical evidence that Vermeer used such a device, but the way he portrays perspective in many of his paintings, including Officer and Laughing Girl, suggests that he did. Created circa 1658, this is one of Vermeer's most celebrated works, which is now housed in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. The painting shows a milkmaid, a woman who milks cows and makes dairy products like butter and cheese, in a plain room carefully pouring milk into a squat earthenware container on a table. Milkmaids began working solely in the stables before large houses hired them to do housework as well, rather than hiring out for more staff. Also on the table in front of the milkmaid are various types of bread. She is a young, sturdily built woman wearing a crisp linen cap, a blue apron and work sleeves pushed up from thick forearms. A foot warmer is on the floor behind her, near Delft wall tiles depicting Cupid, to the viewer's left, and a figure with a pole, to the right. Intense light streams from the window on the left side of the canvas. The painting is strikingly illusionistic, conveying not just details but a sense of the weight of the woman and the table. The light, though bright, doesn't wash out the rough texture of the bread crusts or flatten the volumes of the maid's thick waist and rounded shoulders, wrote Karen Rosenberg, an art critic for the New York Times. Yet with half of the woman's face in shadow, it is impossible to tell whether her downcast eyes and pursed lips express wistfulness or concentration, she wrote. It's a little bit of a Mona Lisa effect in modern viewers' reactions to the painting, according to Walter Liedtke, curator of the Department of European Paintings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and organizer of two Vermeer exhibits. There's a bit of mystery about her for modern audiences. She is going about her daily task, faintly smiling, and our reaction is, what is she thinking? In Dutch literature and paintings of Vermeer's time, Maids were often depicted as subjects of male desire, dangerous women threatening the honor and security of the home, the center of Dutch life. Although some contemporaries, such as Peter de Hooch, had started to represent them in a more neutral way, as did Michael Swiertz. Vermeer's painting is one of the rare examples of a maid treated in an empathetic and dignified way, Vermeer's painting is even more understated, although the use of symbols remains. One of the Delft tiles at the foot of the wall behind the maid, near the foot warmer, depicts Cupid, which can imply arousal of a woman, or simply that while she is working, she is daydreaming about a man. Other amorous symbols in the painting include a wide-mouthed jug, often used as a symbol of the female anatomy. The foot warmer was often used by artists as a symbol for female sexual arousal because when placed under a skirt, it heats the whole body below the waist, according to Liedtke. The coals enclosed inside the foot warmer could symbolize either the heat of lust in tavern or brothel scenes or the hidden but true burning passion of a woman for her husband, according to Serena Kant a British art historian and lecturer. 
yet the whitewashed wall and presence of milk seemed to indicate that the room was a cool kitchen used for cooking with dairy products such as milk and butter, so the foot warmer would have a pragmatic purpose there. Since other Dutch paintings of the period indicate that foot warmers were used when seated, its presence in the picture may symbolize the standing woman's hard-working nature, according to Kant. The painting was first owned by Peter van Ryven, Vermeer's main patron, who also owned works by Vermeer of attractive young women with themes of sexual desire. This painting has perhaps the most brilliant color scheme of his oeuvre. Already in the 18th century, English painter and critic Joshua Reynolds praised the work for its striking quality. One of the distinctions of Vermeer's palette, compared with his contemporaries, was his preference for the expensive natural ultramarine made from crushed lapis lazuli, where other painters typically used the much cheaper azurite. Along with the ultramarine, Lead tin yellow is also a dominant color in an exceptionally luminous work, with a much less somber and conventional rendering of light than any of Vermeer's previous extant works. Depicting white walls was a challenge for artists in Vermeer's time, with his contemporaries using various forms of gray pigment. Here the white walls reflect the daylight with different intensities, displaying the effects of uneven textures on the plastered surfaces. The artist here used white lead, umber and charcoal black. Although the formula was widely known among Vermeer's contemporary genre painters, perhaps no artist more than Vermeer was able to use it so effectively, according to the Essential Vermeer website. The woman's coarse features are painted with thick dabs of impasto. The seeds on the crust of the bread, as well as the crust itself, along with the plaited handles of the bread basket, are rendered with pointillé dots. Soft parts of the bread are rendered with thin swirls of paint, with dabs of ochre used to show the rough edges of broken crust. One piece of bread to the viewer's right and close to the Dutch oven has a broad band of yellow, different from the crust, which Kant believes is a suggestion that the piece is going stale. The small roll at the far right has thick impasto dots that resemble a knobbly crust or a crust with seeds on it. The bread and basket, despite being closer to the viewer, are painted in a more diffuse way than the illusionistic realism of the wall, with its stains, shadowing, nail and nail hole, or the seams and fastenings of the woman's dress, the gleaming, polished brass container hanging from the wall. The panes of glass in the window are varied in a very realistic way, with a crack in one, fourth row from the bottom, far right, reflected on the wood of the window frame. Just below that pane another has a scratch, indicated with a thin white line. Another pane, second row from the bottom, second from right, is pushed inward within its frame. The discrepancy between objects at various distances from the viewer may indicate Vermeer used a camera obscura, according to Kant. Liedtke points out that a pinhole discovered in the canvas has really punctured the theory of the camera obscura. The idea that Vermeer traced compositions in an optical device is rather naive when you consider that the light lasts maybe 10 seconds, but the painting took at least months to paint. Instead, the pin in the canvas would have been tied to a string with chalk on it, which the painter would have snapped to get perspective lines, Liedtke said in a 2009 interview. The woman's bulky green oversleeves were painted with the same yellow and blue paint used in the rest of the woman's clothing, worked at the same time in a wet-on-wet -wet method. Broad strokes in the painting of the clothing suggests the coarse, thick texture of the work clothing. The blue cuff uses a lighter mixture of ultramarine and lead white, together with a layer of ochre painted beneath it. The brilliant blue of the skirt or apron has been intensified with a glaze, a thin, transparent top layer, of the same color. 
The glazing helps suggest that the blue material is a less coarse fabric than the yellow bodice, according to Kant. The Milkmaid was exhibited at the 1939 World's Fair in New York City, and the outbreak of World War II during the fair, with the German occupation of the Netherlands, caused the work to remain in the U.S. until Holland was liberated. During this time, it was displayed at the Detroit Institute of Arts in Michigan, the museum where the curator of the World's Fair exhibit was working, and was included in that museum's exhibition catalogues in 1939 and 1941. During the war, the work was also displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where it was hanging as late as 1944, according to Leitke. In 1953, the Kunsthaus Zurich displayed the painting in an exhibition, and the next year it travelled to Italy for an exhibition at the Palazzo delle Esposizioni in Rome and the Palazzo Reale in Milan. In 1966, it was part of an exhibition at the Moritz Suisse in The Hague and the Musée de l'Orangerie in Paris. In 1999 and 2000, the painting was at the National Gallery of Art in Washington for its exhibition Johannes Vermeer, The Art of Painting, and it was part of the Vermeer and the Delft School exhibition at the National Gallery London from June 20th to September 16th, 2001. It did not appear at the Metropolitan Museum of Art venue of that exhibition earlier that year. The painting returned to New York in 2009 on the occasion of the 400th anniversary of Henry Hudson's historic voyage, Amsterdam to Manhattan, where it was the central feature of a Metropolitan Museum of Art exhibition alongside several of the museum's five Vermeer works and other Dutch Golden Age paintings. Vermeer's paintings from the 1650s demonstrate the influence of masters like Rembrandt and the Italian Caravaggio, which he would have known through the work of the Utrecht Caravaggisti painters such as Gerrit van Honthorst and Dirk van Baburen. However, over the course of the decade, Vermeer became increasingly interested in genre scenes. He was most likely influenced by Peter de Hooch, a prominent Delft genre painter whose quiet domestic scenes feature figures within light-filled interiors and a sensitive rendering of texture, light and shadow. His earlier genre paintings are marked by their tactility. They feature the extensive use of pointillés, small dots of paint, and thick impasto to render surfaces and the effects of light. The Glass of Wine. Vermeer was about 27 when he painted The Glass of Wine, and some critics believe it was his first fully mature work. The painting is housed in the Gemälde Galerie Berlin, where it enjoys a popular reputation. It portrays a seated woman and a standing man drinking in an interior setting. It contains figures situated in a brightly lit and spacious interior, while its architectural space is highly defined. In addition, the work's figures are set in the middle ground, rather than positioned in the foreground. The concept of figures drinking around a table and the portrayal of a woman drinking from a glass are taken directly from de Hooch's A Dutch Courtyard. However, Vermeer's work breaks away from the prototypes of de Hooch, as the interior is rendered in a far more elegant and higher class setting than the older master's works. The clothes of the figures, the patterned tablecloth, 
the gilded picture frame hanging on the back wall, and the coat of arms in the stained window glass all suggest a wealthier setting. Compared to his earlier paintings, Vermeer's brushwork in the wine glass is subdued, while the faces and clothes of the figures are depicted with wide, smooth outlines. Only in the tapestry of the tablecloth and the window glass did the artist apply finely detailed, linear brush strokes. At the time, Vermeer was not the only Dutch artist attempting to develop the ideas of de Hooch. Contemporary paintings from Jan Steen, Gerard Terborch, and Franz van Mieris the Elder also display a refined technique. A Lady and Two Gentlemen. Also known as The Girl with the Wine Glass, this painting was finished by 1660 and is housed in the Herzog Anton Ulrich Museum in Brunswick, Germany. The work was acquired by the Duke of Brunswick in 1711. The Duke's collection has been on display since 1754, making it the oldest gallery open to the public in Germany. The painting depicts two men, one appearing to be unlucky in love, while the other pays servile attention to the young woman. She is portrayed wearing a rich dress, contrasting with the questionable propriety of their exchange. Her face displays an ambiguous smile, poised between genuine pleasure and a plea for help. Her eyes lock directly on the viewer of the painting, adding to the mystery of the work.
View of Delft. Housed in a museum in The Hague, this monumental landscape painting is considered by some to be Vermeer's masterpiece. Completed circa 1661, it depicts the artist's hometown in realistic detail, using pointillism to great effect. The sky dominates most of the picture and demonstrates Vermeer's fascination with light and its rendering effects on everyday life. The painting has always enjoyed a good reputation, receiving high purchase prices from its earliest history. In the mid-19th century, the painting inspired French critic Théophile Torre to rediscover Vermeer, who had become a lost painter until then. A technical analysis shows that Vermeer used calcite, lead white, yellow ochre, natural ultramarine, and madder lake pigments. The landscape was painted from an elevated position to the southeast of Delft, possibly the upper floor of the Mechelen Tavern where the artist's studio was located. To the very right of the painting is a medieval brick building called the Rotterdam Gate, in front of which are two herring buses. It is one of two gates on Delft's south side, the other being the Schiedam Gate, shown in the middle of the composition. There is a bridge between the Rotterdam Gate and the Schiedam Gate, which has a clock on its roof. Behind the Schiedam Gate is a long red-roofed arsenal now known as the Leger Museum. The buildings are reflected in the calm harbour of the River Schie, which was colloquially known as the Kolk Pond. On the lower left side of the painting, five people are waiting to board a passenger barge to take them to Rotterdam, Schiedam, or Delfts Haven. The passenger barge was pulled by a horse and could hold up to 30 people. Vermeer painted his initials, VM, on the red interior of the barge. To the barge's right are two women talking to each other. Vermeer originally painted a third person next to them, but later changed his mind and painted him out. Behind the Rotterdam Gate is the illuminated spire of the Neuer Kirk. In reality, the Neuer Kirk would be positioned more toward the right, but Vermeer depicted it closer to the centre to make it more prominent. There are no bells in the tower in this painting, as those would not be added to the church until after the painting was completed in 1661. The Neuer Kirk was where Vermeer was baptised at one to two weeks old, and where his mother and elder sister were buried. In the background is the top of the tower of the Oude Kirk, Old Church, which was built around 1246, making it Delft's oldest parish church. Vermeer is buried there. Peter Kleisun van Rijven, a lover of architectural paintings, commissioned View of Delft along with the Little Street. Van Rijven was a native of Delft, and only eight years Vermeer's senior. He may have been introduced to Vermeer by his brother, Jan van Ruyven, the notary who documented Vermeer's marriage to Katharina Bolness. It is known for certain, however, that in 1657 van Ruyven lent Vermeer 200 guilders. He left 500 guilders in his will for Vermeer and specifically worded the document so that Katharina Bolness would not inherit the money. Vermeer was the only person named in the will who was not part of his or his wife's family. After van Ruyven's death, view of Delft was inherited by his daughter Magdalena. It was auctioned by her husband Jacob Dicius on 16th May 1696 for 200 guilders. This works out to about $21,000 in 2024. In the 18th century, it was owned by merchant Willem Philip Copps. After his death, it passed on to his wife, who in turn after her death in 1820, passed it on to her daughter, Johanna Copps, who finally decided to auction it. The director of the Mauritshuis at the time, Johann Steingracht van Oostkapel, instructed the minister not to bid on it, as it would not fit in the cabinet. On the other hand, the director of the Rijksmuseum, Cornelius Apostol 
urged the minister to ask the King William Vaughan for money to buy it. The painting was then sold to the Dutch government in 1822 by Simon Johannes Steenstra of Amsterdam for 2,900 guilders. However, the king had it exhibited in the new Dutch Royal Cabinet of Paintings established at the Moritz Huys in The Hague and not in Amsterdam as expected. The reasons for this decision are not known. It is assumed that William I simply liked the painting or that he saw the depiction of the new Kirk as a reminder of his ancestors. Girl interrupted at her music. This painting is now part of the Frick Collection in New York and was completed by 1661. It depicts a young woman who appears to have been interrupted in playing her music by a man looking down at the score. The quizzical look on the girl's face is ambiguous, as in many other depictions of young women in the artist's oeuvre. The identity of the man is also questionable. Music teacher or lover? adding to the mystique of the painting. It was painted in the Baroque style, probably between the years 1658 and 1659, using oil on canvas. In this painting, Vermeer depicts a woman at her music with a gentleman beside her. This painting shows the typical courtship during the 17th century in Europe. It also focuses on the importance of music when it comes to love. The room that they are shown in is one of higher class, most likely belonging to a person of haute bourgeoisie. The painting is very reminiscent of Vermeer's other works. The wine glass, discreetly shown on the table behind the songbook, is tied with both joyfulness and seduction. In the 17th century, it was popular to paint scenes that depicted feasts that included drinking, gaming, and playing music. Later on, these large gatherings became smaller and more exclusive with two or three people shown. Drinking wine was also associated with love during this time period. You can see that the glass is full and untouched, which symbolizes the slow-moving relationship between the man and the woman. On the left side of the painting is a multi-paned window from which the light source is provided for the scene. Vermeer used the same window design in nine of his other works. The music lesson, the girl with the wine glass, the glass of wine, officer and laughing girl, lady writing a letter with her maid, woman with a water jug, woman with a lute, woman holding a balance, and woman with a pearl necklace. Some experts questioned whether this painting was by Vermeer. The precision of the lighting from the window was thought to prove that it was in fact an original Vermeer. The chairs depicted in the painting are thought to have been from Spain. They are some of the few objects in the painting that were not damaged by heavy restoration. You can see the minute details including the lion head carving, the brass studs, and the lozenge pattern that were all popular aspects of furniture during the time. The hazy painting in the background of the scene is of Cupid. The painting within a painting was discovered after its restoration in 1907. It had been covered up by a wall and a hanging violin. Several observations have been made about the Cupid painting and what it could have to do with the overall painting including that Cupid may be warning the couple about the dangers of love, that Cupid's upraised hand was a symbol that you must only have one lover, that Cupid is holding up a blank card which represents love as a game, or shows that love is in the air. The reason for Vermeer including the miniature Cupid painting may never be revealed due to the painting's damaged condition. 
On the table sits a vase made of porcelain and silver, likely used for serving wine. One of the main centers for porcelain in the Netherlands was, and still is, Delft, although they had limited success in recreating Chinese porcelain. Love and music often went hand in hand in the 17th century, especially with the presence of a musical duet between a man and a woman. Playing music with one another was one of the few activities where young people of the opposite sex could socialize. The two in the painting were likely part of the haute bourgeoisie, which meant that they were worldly and educated when it came to music, and each likely had a personal collection of songbooks. In 1662, Vermeer became the head of the Guild of St. Luke, which meant that he would have been in close contact with numerous Delft patrons, artists and collectors. The new position established him as a well-respected painter, although the few paintings that exist have led many scholars to calculate that the artist only produced three or so paintings per year. While Vermeer continued to primarily paint genre scenes through the 1660s, his brushwork became noticeably smoother and refined, without the use of thick impasto that marked his earlier works, while his pointillés are also less intrusive. This refinement in style can be in part attributed to the developments of the Leiden fine painters, who were known for their highly rendering of interiors and domestic scenes with nearly imperceptible brushwork. Vermeer's famous girl with a pearl earring, with its luminous, smooth surfaces and nearly invisible brushwork, is an example of this shift in style. Woman in Blue Reading a Letter Housed in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, this painting was completed by 1663. The central element of the painting is a woman in blue standing in front of a window, not depicted, reading a letter. The woman appears to be pregnant, although many have argued that the woman's rounded figure is simply a result of the fashions of the day. Although the woman's loose clothing may be suggestive, pregnancy was very rarely depicted in art during this period. While the contents of the letter are not visible, the composition of the painting is revealing. The map of the county of Holland and West Friesland in the Netherlands on the wall behind the woman has been interpreted as suggesting that the letter she reads was written by a travelling husband. Alternatively, the box of pearls barely visible on the table before the woman might suggest a lover, as pearls are sometimes a symbol of vanity. The very action of letter-reading reflects a thematic pattern throughout Vermeer's works, as a common private moment becomes revealing of the human condition. The painting is unique among Vermeer's interiors in that no fragment of corner, floor or ceiling can be seen. The composition and the female figure are similar to Vermeer's 1657-59 painting girl, reading a letter at an open window. This work has similarities to his similarly dated woman with a pearl necklace and woman holding a balance. The map drawn by Balthazar Flores, Van Berkenrode, was published in 1620 and reprinted by Willem Bleu in 1621. It also appears in Vermeer's Officer and Laughing Girl. 
The latter, however, shows a polychromatic map while woman reading a letter depicts a monochromatic print. That such a map really existed is proven by a monochromatic exemplar preserved in the collection of the Westfries Museum at Horn. One day in 1663, while Vermeer was away from the house, his wife's absent and aggressive brother Willem returned and physically attacked the heavily pregnant Katharina, threatening to stab her with a pointed metal stick. The mother and unborn child were saved from the attack when the Vermeer's maidservant put herself between the siblings. According to court records, Willem was heard to shout she-devil and old popish swine at Katharina and her mother Maria before being taken away and incarcerated until the end of his life. Interestingly, the traumatic, violent episode didn't make its way into Vermeer's art. On the contrary, the calm that Vermeer was known to capture in paint reflects a world that he himself perhaps wished to inhabit. The Music Lesson Completed by 1665, this painting now forms part of the Royal Collection in St. James's Palace, London, where it has remained since the reign of King George III. For many years it was unknown that the work was by Vermeer, until in 1866 Théophile Torre revealed its true creator. The music lesson is a painting of a young female pupil receiving a music lesson from a man. The man's mouth is slightly agape, giving the impression that he is singing along with the music that the young girl is playing. This suggests that there is a relationship between the two figures and the idea of love and music being bridged together. This was a common theme among Netherlandish art in this time period. Vermeer consistently used the same objects within his paintings, such as the draped rug, the white water jug, various instruments, tiled floor and windows that convey light and shadows. This is one of few paintings produced by Vermeer which were kept in his home until his death in 1675, when his family was forced to sell them. It became a part of the royal collection, and it is currently on display in the Picture Gallery at Buckingham Palace in London. The painting depicts a young woman playing a virginal, a small harpsichord, while an elegantly dressed man stands beside her, watching intently. The lid of the harpsichord bears the inscription, Music is a companion in pleasure, a balm in sorrow. Behind the woman, a large vial is seen on the floor, appearing to be in a vulnerable position if the lady was to step back. The piece is notable for its delineation of horizontal and diagonal lines and the complex structure they offer to the viewer. 
The picture was sold in May 1696 in Delft, part of the collection of Jacob de Sue, which included many Vermeers. It was later acquired by Venetian artist Giovanni Antonio Pellegrini in 1718, with Pellegrini's collection later being bought by Joseph Smith. The music lesson has been part of the Royal Collection of Great Britain since 1762, when King George III bought Smith's collection of paintings. When the painting was acquired, it was believed to be a work by Franz van Mieris the Elder because of a misinterpretation of the signature. It was not correctly attributed to Vermeer until 1866 by Théophile Torre, though some scholars were skeptical whether it was Vermeer or not. Woman Holding a Balance. This painting was completed by 1663 and previously called Woman Weighing Gold, before microscopic evaluation confirmed that the balance in her hands is empty. The painting was among the large collection of Vermeer works sold on May 16, 1696 in Amsterdam from the estate of Jacob Dysius, 1653-1695. It received 155 guilders, considerably above the prices fetched at the time for his other works, though somewhat below the milkmaid, which received 177. Also called Woman Testing a Balance, is an oil painting by Dutch Golden Age painter Johannes Vermeer, now in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. At one time the painting was known as Woman Weighing Gold, but closer evaluation has determined that the balance in her hand is empty. Opinions on the theme and symbolism of the painting differ, with the woman alternatively viewed as a symbol of holiness or earthliness. In the painting, Vermeer has depicted what discreetly appears to be a young pregnant woman holding an empty balance before a table on which stands an open jewellery box the pearls and gold within spilling over. A blue cloth rests in the left foreground beneath a mirror and a window to the left, unseen save its golden curtain, provides light. Behind the woman is a painting of the Last Judgment featuring Christ with raised outstretched hands. The woman may have been modelled on Vermeer's wife, Katharina Vermeer. According to Robert Huerta in Vermeer and Plato, Painting the Ideal, 2005, the image has been variously interpreted as a vanitas painting, as a representation of divine truth or justice, as a religious meditative aid, and as an incitement to lead a balanced, thoughtful life. Some viewers have imagined the woman is weighing her valuables, while others compare her actions to Christ's, reading parable into the pearls. Some art critics, including John Michael Montius, who describes her as symbolically weighing unborn souls, have seen the woman as a figure of Mary. To some critics who perceive her as measuring her valuables, 
The juxtaposition with the final judgment suggests that the woman should be focusing on the treasures of heaven rather than those of earth, with the mirror on the wall reinforcing the vanity of her pursuits. Other historians have suggested that the balance represents her careful harmonization of worldly possessions and spiritual piety. In this interpretation, the mirror on the wall reflects the woman's self-knowledge. Woman with a Pearl Necklace. This painting was created between 1662 and 1665 and is now housed in the Gemälde Galerie Berlin. It depicts a young woman holding her pearl necklace up to the light, apparently considering whether it is the right piece of jewelry to wear. The woman is caught at the exact moment where she considers her own beauty. Interestingly, the mirror appears to be too high for the woman to be naturally able to view her reflection perhaps commenting in part on her vanity. It is believed that this painting was originally kept in Vermeer's wife's bedroom, where it was recorded as being found following his death. Vermeer only kept four of his own paintings, which suggests that the sitter of this work was most likely his wife. Painted in 1664, this scene depicts a young Dutch woman looking left toward a window's light source. Dressed in a yellow fur-trimmed coat, this young woman most likely comes from an upper-class family. With Vermeer's distinctive style, it incorporates the color yellow, a draped curtain, framed pictures on the walls, a light source from the left, as well as domestic tools and an expressive profile. For example, to the far left, a yellow drawn-back curtain is used. With a rich tone of lemon yellow to complete the woman's jacket, Vermeer is able to create a balance between the two ends of his painting. The window that the curtain would cover is very similar to that in his painting Woman with a Water Jug. On that same side of the wall, Vermeer displays a framed mirror. The black frame is most likely made of ebony, which indicates wealth and status. The fact that Vermeer uses a mirror is also distinctive. Vermeer associated the sense of reflection to portray the woman with vanity or feminine power. Also due to Vermeer's interest in certain Greek muses, he used the mirror to portray duality. Other historians believe this mirror may indicate a Dutch theme of vanitas or the reminder of death. However, there is not a specific way historians can determine this. A large portion of the painting happened to be the white walls. This allows the painter to set a stage for his main subject, the young woman. Without any distraction on the wall behind her, the viewer can look more to the main figure's expression and actions. The young woman is definitely the most descriptive part of the piece. Like many of his other featured women, she is portrayed in a yellow, fur-trimmed morning coat. Comparing these trims, historians can investigate how Vermeer painted. From the microscopic brush strokes, historians can decipher many thin layers of grey and white, which reveal Vermeer's attempt to create realism. Like Vermeer during the Baroque period, many Dutch artists were striving for simple, clear and natural realism. These coats also give historians a glimpse into the period.
In the middle 1660s, many Dutch interiors were filled with a variety of furs. These pieces were commonly used during long Dutch winters. These styles of furs were actually recorded in Vermeer's home in 1676. The woman's facial expression is also telling. As she seems to be finishing up her morning routine, the young woman is caught clasping her pearl necklace together. Her facial expression stares blankly and almost vainly ahead of herself, possibly out the window or into the black-framed mirror. The woman retains a nice profile yet blank look. This three-quarter pose was very common to the period and revealed a distinct quality of Dutch Baroque painting. Another important aspect of Vermeer's woman with pearl necklace is the placement of the domestic tools on the table. A water basin, comb and powder brush are all displayed on the table. This painting may suggest criticism towards a young upper-class women's frivolity, lack of occupation and her ample time for petty activities. Lastly, the deep blue tablecloth draped over the left side of the painting brings strong contrast to the work. Vermeer needed to create a contrast spot in order to maintain the geometric layout of the painting. Woman with a Lute, housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, this painting was created circa 1663. The painting depicts a young woman wearing an ermine-trimmed jacket and enormous pearl earrings as she eagerly looks out a window, presumably expecting a male visitor. A musical courtship is suggested by the viola da gamba on the floor in the foreground and by the flow of songbooks across the tabletop and onto the floor, according to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The tuning of a lute was recognized by contemporary viewers as a symbol of the virtue of temperance. The canvas was almost certainly cut from the same bolt as that used for lady writing a letter with her maid. The work likely was painted shortly after young woman with a water pitcher, and it shares with that painting its framing of the figure within rectangular motifs. But the painting has more muted tones, reflecting a shift in that direction by Vermeer in the mid to late 1660s. At this time, Vermeer began using shadows and soft contours to further evoke an atmosphere of intimacy. The impression of spatial recession and atmosphere is somewhat diminished by darkening with age of the objects in the foreground and by abrasion of the paint surface, mostly in the same area. The painting was given to the museum in 1900 by a bequest of railroad industrialist Collis Potter Huntington.
Woman with a Water Jug. This painting was completed by 1662 and is housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York. This painting is one of a closely related group painted in the early to mid-1660s as the artist was not using linear perspective and geometric order, and the light was his only source of emphasis. The work suggests that Vermeer was aware that light is composed of colours and the effect of colours on one another. For instance, the blue drape is reflected as dark blue on the side of the metallic pitcher, and the red fabric modifies the gold hue of the basin's underside. The work was purchased by Henry Gurdon Marquand in 1887 at a Paris gallery for $800. When Marquand brought it to the United States, it was the first Vermeer in America. Marquand donated the artwork along with other pieces in his collection to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. A young woman is found in the center of the picture. She is opening a window with her right hand, while she holds a water jug with her left hand. This jug rests on a larger platter. Both of these, among other objects, are upon on a table. This is decorated with a predominantly red rug of Asian origin. Behind the table stands a chair upon which lies a blue material. The woman gazes out the window. The clothing of the woman consists of a dark blue dress with a black and gold bodice. A white cloth serves as her headpiece. A map hangs in the background on the wall is by Huyck Alart and depicts the 17 provinces of the Netherlands. Girl with a Pearl Earring. Widely considered a masterpiece of Western art, this portrait is housed in the Moritz Schuss Gallery in The Hague and is often referred to as the Mona Lisa of the North. Going by various names over the centuries, it became known by its present title towards the end of the 20th century after the earring worn by the girl portrayed there. His signature, Ivy Mir, is located in the upper left corner of the painting, although it is not very prominent and can be difficult to see. It is estimated to have been painted around 1665. In 1881, on the advice of Victor de Stewers, who for years tried to prevent Vermeer's rare works from being sold to parties abroad, Arnoldus Andres de Tombe purchased the work at an auction in The Hague for only two guilders and 30 cents, around 24 euros at current purchasing power. At the time, it was in poor condition. Des Tombe had no heirs and donated this and other paintings to the Moritz Huys in 1902. In 1937, a similar painting, Smiling Girl, at the time also thought to be by Vermeer, was donated by collector Andrew William Mellon to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Now widely considered to be a fake, the painting was claimed by Vermeer expert Arthur Wheelock in a 1995 study to be by 20th century artist and forger Theo van Veengarden, a friend of Han van Meegeren.
The famous painting depicts a girl turning to look over her shoulder, with her lips slightly open as though about to speak. The painting is given a very dark background, which draws the viewer into the painting more and gives the girl a three-dimensional quality. Using the technique of sfumato, the blurring of lines, much like how Leonardo used the method in the Mona Lisa, Vermeer achieves a very realistic portrayal of the girl's features. The painting is a trony, the Dutch 17th century description of a head that was not meant to be a portrait. It depicts a European girl wearing exotic dress, an oriental turban, and what appears to be a very large pearl as an earring. The subject of the painting is unknown, with it being possible either that she was a real model or that Vermeer created a more generalized and mysterious woman, perhaps representing a sibyl or biblical figure. There has been speculation that she is the artist's eldest daughter, Maria, though this has been dismissed as an anachronism by some art historians. After the most recent restoration of the painting in 1994, the subtle color scheme and the intimacy of the girl's gaze toward the viewer have been greatly enhanced. During the restoration, it was discovered that the dark background, today somewhat mottled, was originally a deep enamel-like green. This effect was produced by applying a thin transparent layer of paint, a glaze over the black background seen now. However, the two organic pigments of the green glaze, indigo and weld, have faded. In 2014, Dutch astrophysicist Vincent Ick raised doubts about the material of the earring and argued that it looks more like polished tin than pearl on the grounds of the specular reflection, the pear shape and the large size of the earring. As an example of how celebrated the painting is, Novelist Tracy Chevalier published a historical novel, also entitled Girl with a Pearl Earring, in 1999, which encouraged new interest in Vermeer and his works. The novel was later adapted for film and as a successful play. A lady writing a letter. This painting is believed to have been completed by artist during his mature phase, circa 1665. The lady depicted is writing a letter and appears to have been interrupted as she turns her head to regard the viewer. It is believed by many critics that Vermeer was inspired in this work by Ter Borch, a Dutch artist who had tackled the theme previously ten years ago. The lady in the painting is shown writing a letter while sitting at a table in a room. She appears to have been interrupted as she has turned her head away from the letter to look towards the viewer while she continues to hold the quill in her right hand. She is dressed elegantly in a lemon-yellow morning jacket and wears a necklace with ten pearls and two pearl earrings. The number of compositional elements in the painting are limited and the focus is the woman's figure and the sparse objects in the woman and the table are brought near to the picture plane, which emphasizes the directness of her gaze. All small objects in the painting are placed on the table. 
This concentration of small forms stand in contrasts with the large forms used in the rest of the composition, which create a geometric framework for the figure. On the back of the wall is a painting, which covers two-thirds of the width of the composition. The painting of which only a part is shown in the picture depicts a large string instrument, possibly a double bass. It is known from the inventory of Vermeer's estate that he owned a vanitas still life with a double bass and skull. Based on a comparison of the depicted work and its description in the inventory of Vermeer's estate with the known vanitas still lifes of the Dutch painter Cornelis van der Meulen, it is likely that the painting on the wall is by van der Meulen's hand. Vanitas paintings were popular in the Dutch Republic. They aim to evoke the meaninglessness of worldly aspirations and the transient nature of all human endeavours, often by contrasting symbols of death and decay with luxurious objects or other items which relate to worldly success. Vermeer's intention in including a vanitas painting in a rich interior with an elegantly dressed lady was likely to convey this philosophical vanitas message that all worldly possessions and achievements are ultimately doomed to fail and end in death. Many of the objects seen in the painting, such as the woman's coat, the cloth on the table and the string of pearls, also appear in other Vermeer works. This has led to speculation that he or his family members owned the objects, and even that the subjects of the paintings are his relatives. It has often been suggested that in his paintings, Vermeer sought to depict in his models that which he could not give to his wife and family, calm and affluence. In 1940, a lady writing was bought by Sir Harry Oakes, the magistrate of the Bahamas, where it was hung until Oakes's death. After he had opposed a casino license, Oakes was tragically murdered by the Mafia. The painting was then sold by his widow to Horace Havermeyer, whose sons later bequeathed it to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. girl with a red hat. This painting was completed by 1666 and is classed as being one of Vermeer's tronies, a genre of painting that depicts models fancifully dressed, unintended to be portraits of specific subjects. The portrait depicts a very young woman dressed in blue, wearing a collar that appears to be lace and a red hat. Her hair is up and she wears a pair of dangling earrings. She looks at the spectator as if she has just turned her head in the direction of a sound, a voice that has captured her attention. Her mouth is ajar and her face, slightly pink, receives light from the right, which is unusual in the works of Johannes Vermeer. However, after a study using the latest technology in preparation for a 2022 exhibition titled Vermeer's Secrets, it was ascertained that Vermeer began by painting the portrait of a man wearing a wide-brimmed hat. 
The older pigment analysis by art historian Hans Kuhn was supplemented by a more recent investigation. The red hat is painted in two layers. The lower layer consists of vermilion mixed with a black pigment. The upper layer is a madder lake glaze. Vermeer used a mixture of azurite and yellow ochre for the green areas and umber, umbra, for the browns in the wall. The painting may have been among those owned by Vermeer's patron, Ruyven. In 1932, to the Andrew William Mellon Educational and Charitable Trust in Pittsburgh, gave the painting to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, where it hangs today. with a flute. This painting is also housed in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. The attribution to Vermeer has been considered controversial by some art historians who have pointed out that the poor representation of the dubious musical instrument in the picture is rare in Vermeer's work. The girl's hat is also odd, with its shape being similar to that of a Chinese coolie hat, which would have been considered an exotic curio in the Netherlands at the time. Though, on the other hand, it would be strange that a forger should have invented such bizarre headwear. Scientific examination of the picture confirms it dates from Vermeer's time. A dendrochronology analysis of the oak panel based on an examination of tree rings, showed that the tree was felled in the early 1650s, which is consistent with the proposed dating for a Vermeer work. The painting was discovered in a private collection in Brussels by Abraham Bredius, who exhibited it at the Maritz Huys in 1906. It was then bought by the American collector Joseph Widner in the 1920s, and given to the National Gallery of Art in Washington in 1942. The concert, completed by 1666, this painting depicts a musical trio of a woman playing a harpsichord, a seated man with a lute, and a woman singing an accompaniment. All three are deep in concentration, and the mood appears to be tranquil. In the foreground of the painting is a table covered with an oriental rug, with scores and a sit-in placed on top. The pattern of the black and white floor tiles draws the eye towards the musical trio gathered around the instrument. The underside of the harpsichord's lid is decorated with a painting of a serene landscape. 
On the back wall to the right there hangs a painting by Dirk van Baburens called The Procuris, which also appears in Vermeer's A Lady Seated at the Virginal, implying that the artist personally owned the work. The concert was owned by the French critic Thoré and sold by his heirs in 1892 to the wealthy American collector Isabella Stewart Gardner, whose house became a museum in Boston on her death in 1924. The painting was the most important work lost when eleven pictures were stolen from the museum on 18th of March 1990, and it has not yet been recovered. It is thought to be the most valuable unrecovered stolen painting, with a value estimated at over $200 million. The Art of Painting. This famous work is an allegory of painting and is the largest and most complex of Vermeer's surviving works. It depicts an artist painting a female subject in his studio by a window with a large map of the Netherlands on the wall behind. The painting has only two figures, the subject and the painter, which is thought to be a self-portrait of Vermeer, though the face is not visible. Experts attribute symbolism to various aspects of the painting. The subject is the muse of history, Cleo, wearing a laurel wreath, holding a trumpet and a large tome. The double-headed eagle, symbol of the Austrian Habsburg dynasty, former rulers of Holland, which adorns the central golden chandelier, may have represented the Catholic faith. Vermeer was unusual in being a Catholic in a predominantly Protestant Netherlands. The absence of candles in the chandelier might represent the suppression of the Catholic faith. The map on the back wall has a rip that divides the Netherlands between the north and south. The rip symbolizes the division between the Dutch Republic to the north and the Habsburg-controlled Flemish provinces to the south. The map by Kleis Jan Schwischke details the earlier political division between the Union of Utrecht to the north and the colonies to the south. The painting is considered to have been very valuable to Vermeer as he chose never to part with it or sell it, even when he was in debt. In 1676, his widow Katharina bequeathed the piece to her mother, Maria Thins, in an attempt to avoid the sale of the painting to satisfy creditors. The executor of Vermeer's estate, the famous Delft microscopist Anton van Leeuwenhoek, determined that the transferal of the work to the late painter's mother-in-law was illegal. It is not known who owned the painting for most of the 18th century. Until 1860, the painting was considered to be by Vermeer's contemporary Peter de Hooch, as Vermeer was little known until the late 19th century. Peter's signature was even forged on the painting. It was at the intervention of French scholar Torre Burger and the German art historian Gustav Friedrich Wagen that it was recognized as a Vermeer original. It was placed on public display in the Chernin Museum in Vienna, after the Nazi invasion of Austria, top Nazi officials, including Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, attempted to acquire the painting. It was finally acquired from its then-owner, 
Count Jaromir Chernin by Adolf Hitler for his personal collection at a price of 1.65 million Reichsmark through his agent, Hans Posse, on November 20, 1940. The painting was rescued from a salt mine at the end of World War II in 1945, where it was preserved from Allied bombing raids with other works of art. The painting was escorted to Vienna from Munich by Andrew Ritchie, chief of the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives program for Austria, who transported it by locking himself and the painting in a train compartment. The Americans gave the painting to the Austrian government in 1946, instead of the Chernin family, as it was deemed to have been sold voluntarily, without undue force from Hitler. The painting is now the property of the state of Austria and on display at the Kunsthistorisches Museum, Vienna. study of a young woman. This portrait was completed by 1667 and is now housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York. Because of its almost identical size and its proximity in tone and composition, it is often considered to be either a variant or counterpart to the famous girl with a pearl earring. The subjects of both paintings wear pearl earrings, have scarves draped over their shoulders, and are shown in front of a plain black background. In addition, it is likely that the creation of both works involved the use of a camera obscura. The sitter is depicted as having a homely face, a wide-spaced and flat face, small nose and thin lips. This apparent lack of idealized beauty has led to a general belief that this work was painted on commission although it is possible that the model was the artist's daughter. The picture encourages the viewer to be curious about the young woman's thoughts, feelings or character, something typical in many of Vermeer's paintings. Girl with a pearl earring and this painting are unusual for Vermeer in that they lack his usual rich background. Instead, the girls are framed by a background of deep black, producing an isolating effect and heightening the girl's appearance of vulnerability. The painting may have been owned by Peter Klaas van Ruyven of Delft before 1674, then by his widow, and next their daughter. Later, Prince Auguste Marie Raymond Darenberg of Brussels owned the painting by 1829, and it remained in his family in Brussels and Schloss Meppen from 1833 to the early 1950s. In 1959, the work was bought in a private sale from the Prince Darenberg by Mr. Charles Reitzman and Mrs. Jane Reitzman of New York for a sum estimated at around £400,000 sterling. In 1979, the Reitzmans donated the picture to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in memory of French painter Theodore Rousseau, Mistress and Maid. Now forming part of the Frick collection in New York, this painting depicts a maid, plainly dressed in a brown bodice and blue apron, leaning towards her mistress while holding a letter tentatively in her hand. The mistress raises her fingers to her chin in a gesture of apprehension, so we are allowed to see little of her expression. Although it is often assumed that the maid is handing her a letter which has just arrived, 
The quill in the mistress's right hand may suggest the maid is asking for instructions on where to deliver the note just written by her mistress. There is a strong use of yellow in the woman's elegant fur-lined overcoat and blue in the silk tablecloth and the maid's apron. The focus of the painting is the two women as they are sitting at a desk, doing an everyday activity. Vermeer was known for his domestic scenes containing women. The light in the painting comes from the left and falls on the mistress's face. The mistress has a pensive gaze, with her lips parted slightly and her fingertips lifted to her chin in a questioning manner. The lighted parts of the yellow overcoat are formed with sweeping brushstrokes of lead-tin yellow, and the shadows are created with definition. Vermeer uses a dark background, as he does in other paintings, such as Portrait of a Young Woman and Girl with a Pearl Earring. Pearls were an important status symbol of the period, and that was reflected in the mistress's fancy attire and her abundance of pearls. Letters are a prevalent theme in Vermeer's paintings from the 1660s. Earlier works, such as Woman in Blue, Reading a Letter, circa 1663-1664, depict a woman by herself with a letter, but in this painting the added maid is a new element. The gestures and expressions of the two women suggest anxiety over the letter and its potential contents. Surviving records show that there was a painting representing two persons, one of whom is writing a letter, which Vermeer's widow Katharina gave to the baker, Van Byten, in settlement of the family's bread bill. The Astronomer. This painting is housed in the Louvre, and along with the next painting, The Geographer, they are both the only paintings by Vermeer to depict a man without a female companion. They were most likely pendants, forming a pair of paintings designed to hang together, since they are almost the same size and depict the same sitter. Both works are also dated with the astronomer being completed in 1668 and the geographer in the following year. The date in this work is inscribed in Roman numerals on the cupboard just above the scholar's hand. The astronomer is portrayed sitting at a table bending forward to turn the globe, version by Jodocus Hondius. Above the cupboard are many books of various sizes, and attached to the front is a curious diagram which has yet to be understood. The book on the table, the 1621 edition of Adrian Metius's Instituciones Astronomicae Geographicae. Symbolically, the volume is open to Book Thre, a section advising the astronomer to seek inspiration from God. On the wall is a painting of The Finding of Moses, Moses may represent knowledge and science, learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, which Vermeer portrayed in at least one other work. 
Portrayals of scientists were a favourite topic in 17th-century Dutch painting, and Vermeer's oeuvre includes both this astronomer and the slightly later the geographer. Both are believed to portray the same man, possibly Antony van Leeuwenhoek. A 2017 study indicated that the canvas for the two works came from the same bolt of material, confirming their close relationship. The two paintings appear to have been kept together until the late 18th century. The astronomer was acquired in the 1880s by the Paris-based banker Baron Alphonse de Rothschild. In 1940, the Nazis confiscated it from his son Edouard and Hitler ordered it to be taken to Germany. In 1945, the astronomer was returned to the Rothschild family and acquired by the Louvre in 1983. The geographer. This painting depicts a geographer bending over a nautical chart. In his right hand he holds a pair of dividers which were commonly used to measure distance on a map. The geographer's eyes peer through the window and sunlight bathes the side of his face as he pauses, silent in contemplation. The room is noticeably brighter than the interior in the astronomer which was completed the year before this work. The geographer, dressed in a Japanese-style robe then popular among scholars, is shown to be someone excited by intellectual inquiry. With his active stance, the presence of maps, charts, a globe and books, as well as the dividers he holds in his right hand, according to Arthur Kingsland Wheelock. The energy in this painting is conveyed most notably through the figure's pose, the massing of objects on the left side of the composition and the sequence of diagonal shadows on the wall to the right. Vermeer made several changes in the painting that enhanced the feeling of energy in the picture. The man's head was originally in a different position to the left of where the viewer now sees it, indicating the man perhaps was looking down rather than peering out the window. The dividers he holds in his hand were originally vertical, not horizontal. A sheet of paper was originally on the small stool at the lower right, and removing it probably made that area darker. Details of the man's face are slightly blurred, suggesting movement, also a feature of Vermeer's mistress and maid, according to Serena Carr. His eyes are narrowed, perhaps squinting in the sunlight or an indication of intense thinking. Carr asserts that the painting depicts a flash of inspiration, or even revelation. The drawn curtain on the left and the position of the oriental carpet on the table pushed back are both symbols of revelation. He grips a book as if he's about to snatch it up to corroborate his ideas. The Globe was published in Amsterdam in 1618 by Jodocus Hondius. Terrestrial and celestial globes were commonly sold together, and the celestial globe in the astronomer was also a Hondius, Hendrik rather than Judicus, another indication that the two paintings were created as pendant pieces, according to Kant. The Globe is turned toward the Indian Ocean, where the Dutch East India Company was then active. Vermeer used an impasto technique to apply pointillé dots, not to indicate light reflected more strongly on certain points, but to emphasize the dull ochre cartouche frame printed on the globe. Since the globe can be identified, 
We know the decorative cartouche includes a plea for information for future editions, reflecting the theme of revelation in the painting. The cartographic objects surrounding the man are some of the actual items a geographer would have. The globe, the dividers the man holds, a cross staff hung on the center post of the window, used to measure the angle of celestial objects like the sun or stars, and the chart the man is using, which according to one scholar, James A. Wellu, appears to be a nautical chart on vellum. The sea chart on the wall of all the sea coasts of Europe has been identified as one published by Willem Jans. Pleo, this accuracy indicates Vermeer had a source familiar with the profession. The astronomer, which seems to form a pendant with this painting, shows a similar sophisticated knowledge of cartographic instruments and books, and the same young man modelled for both. That man himself may have been the source of Vermeer's correct display of surveying and geographical instruments, and possibly of his knowledge of perspective. Wheelock and others assert the model source was probably Antony van Leeuwenhoek, 1632-1723, a contemporary of Vermeer who was also born in Delft. The families of both men were in the textile business, and both families had a strong interest in science and optics. A microscopist, Van Leeuwenhoek, was described after his death as being so skilled in navigation, astronomy, mathematics, philosophy, and natural science that one can certainly place him with the most distinguished masters of the art. Another image of Van Leeuwenhoek by the Delft artist Jan Verkolje about twenty years later, shows a broad face and straight nose, similar to Vermeer's model. At the time Vermeer painted the two works, the scientist would have been about thirty-six years old. He would have been actively studying for his examination for surveyor, which he passed on 4 February 1669. There is no documentary evidence for any kind of relationship between the two men during Vermeer's lifetime, although in 1676, Van Leeuwenhoek was appointed a trustee for Vermeer's estate. The pose of the figure in Vermeer's painting takes up precisely the position of Faust in Rembrandt's famous etching, although facing the opposite direction, according to Lawrence Gowing. Similar arrangements can be found in drawings by Nicolaes Meiss. Vermeer's signature is inscribed on the cupboard, and with the year 1669 on the wall behind. The inscription on the wall was painted in the 18th or 19th century. It may give the correct year having been copied from an accurate source, although, like the astronomer, it might date from the previous year. The wealth of his wife's family allowed Vermeer to paint for his own pleasure, rather than to support his family, as was the case for most other painters, and he never took on pupils or apprentices.
The painter was also known to have used expensive pigments like lapis lazuli for the skirt of the milkmaid and deep carmine for the dress of the girl with a wine glass. While some have suggested that Vermeer's long-term patron, Peter van Ruyven, would have bought and supplied the artist with these exclusive ingredients, it is perhaps unsurprising that it was around this time that the painter began his own downward slide into debt. The Love Letter Housed in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, this painting depicts a seated woman playing the sitten, having been interrupted by her maid, who hands her a letter. Above the fireplace, two paintings are displayed, the lower one depicting a sailing boat, which some believe is a lost work by Vermeer, and the other picture is a landscape in the style of Jacob van Roosdael. The tied-up curtain in the foreground creates the impression that the viewer is looking at an intensely private, personal scene. There is also an element of trompe l'oeil, as Dutch paintings were often hung with little curtains to conserve them, and the device of painted curtains is seen in other Dutch works of the period. The diagonals on the checkered floor create the impression of depth and three-dimensionality. The fact that it is a love letter that the woman has received is made clear by the fact that she is carrying a sitten, a form of lute used in the period as a symbol of love, often carnal love. Luit was also a slang term for vagina. This idea is further reinforced by the slippers at the very bottom of the picture. The removed slipper was another symbol of sex. The floor brush would appear to represent domesticity, and its placement at the side of the painting may suggest that domestic concerns have been forgotten or pushed aside. The colours blue and gold are important in the composition of the painting. In the household that the love letter takes place in, gilded ornamentation indicates substantial wealth. The gold is located on the woman's dress, the top of the fireplace, and many of the objects which complements the blue on the floor, the maid's dress, the picture frames. Classical influence is also apparent in the ionic columns of the fireplace. The two paintings on the wall are also significant. The lower painting is of a stormy sea, a metaphor for tempestuous love. Above it is a landscape painting of a traveller on a sandy road. This may refer to the absence of the man who is writing to the lady. Love Letter remains the only one of Vermeer's works to incorporate a seascape. The two women are most likely the same models as those in the earlier Mistress and Maid. Both works concern a letter and provoke questions regarding the mistress's relationship with an absent lover. Interestingly, the love letter was stolen on 24th September 1971 whilst on loan to an exhibition in Brussels, but the work was fortunately recovered 13 days later.
the lace maker. This painting was completed by 1670 and is housed in the Louvre, Paris. The lace maker is the smallest of Vermeer's paintings. It depicts a young woman dressed in a yellow shawl, holding a pair of bobbins in her left hand as she carefully places a pin in the pillow on which she is making her bobbin lace. Vermeer probably used a camera obscura while composing the work, as many optical effects typical of photography can be seen, especially the blurring of the foreground. Vermeer presents the various elements which compose both the girl's face and body, as well as the pattern of the material she is working on in an abstract manner. The girl's hands, the curls of her hair, and the cross which form her eyes and nose are all portrayed in an abstract manner unusual for the era in which Vermeer worked. In addition, the red and white of the lace is shown as spilling from the sewing cushion with physical properties suggesting a near-liquid form. The blurring of these threads contrasts sharply with the precision of the lace she is shown working on. Vermeer's painting is often compared to a 1662 canvas of the same name by the Dutch portrait and genre painter Caspar Netscher. However, Vermeer's work is very different in tone. In the earlier work, both the girl's shoes and the muscle shells near her feet have sexual connotations, which are completely absent in Vermeer's handling of the subject. Vermeer's late paintings feature greater abstraction as they focus on describing patterns and colors of objects rather than their textures. These paintings are crisper, with bold and angular planes of color. This development in style can be seen in his paintings such as Lady Writing a Letter with Her Maid, 1670, and The Guitar Player, 1672. Lady writing a letter with her maid, this painting is now housed in the National Gallery of Ireland, Dublin. It depicts a middle-class woman attended by a housemaid who is presumably acting as messenger and go-between for the lady and her lover. The work is seen as a bridge between the quiet restraint and self-containment of Vermeer's work of the 1660s and his relatively cooler work of the 1670s. It may have been partly inspired by Ter Borker's painting Woman Sealing a Letter. The painting's canvas was almost certainly cut from the same bolt used for woman with a lute. Lady writing a letter with her maid is the first of the artist's experiments with centrifugal composition, where the focus is not only on the center of the canvas. In addition, it is his third work in which the drama and dynamic are not centered on a single figure. The maid is shown standing in the mid-ground behind her lady, with her hands crossed and waiting for the letter to be completed. The positions of their bodies indicate that the two women are disconnected. The folded arms of the maid seem outwardly as an attempt to display a sense of self-containment. 
However, she is detached from her lady both emotionally and psychologically. The maid's gaze towards the half-visible window indicates an inner restlessness and boredom as she waits impatiently for the messenger to carry her lady's letter away. Some art historians dispute the absoluteness of this view. According to Pascal Bonafou, while complicity is not indicated by a look or a smile from either woman, the mere fact of her presence during such an intimate act as the composition of a love letter indicates at least a degree of intimacy between the two. The crumpled page lying on the floor could denote an unwelcome letter that the lady has just received or an earlier draft of her letter which she has thrown away. A large painting is depicted on the rear wall of the Finding of Moses, taken from the story in Exodus, describing how the infant Moses was found near the bank of the Nile. Moses is portrayed after his rescue, surrounded by the Pharaoh's daughter and handmaidens. The painting contains many of Vermeer's usual painterly motifs, in particular his obsession with the inside-outside axis of interior spaces, and through his depiction of the tiled floor and the verticals of the dresses, window frame and back wall painting, his interest in geometry and abstract forms, recalling his earlier view of Delft, the lacemaker and the art of painting. This painting was owned by Sir Alfred Beit, the former Member of Parliament, who died in 1994. It was housed at Rusborough House in Ireland, from where it was stolen twice. It was first taken on 26 April 1974, when it was among 18 pictures stolen by a gang connected to the IRA. Lady writing a letter with her maid was recovered eight days later, with very little damage to the work. On 21st May 1986, the painting was stolen a second time and recovered in Antwerp seven years later. Sir Alfred presented a number of paintings to the National Gallery of Ireland in 1987, including this painting, which forms part of the Irish National Collection. Allegory of Faith. This painting is housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York. It is an unusual painting in the oeuvre of Vermeer, in that it represents an allegory of the Catholic faith. The figure of faith is portrayed with a theatrical pose, clasping a hand to her breast, gazing fervently upwards, while her right foot rests on a globe. On the grand table a chalice and an open Bible are displayed. The globe is the same prop that was depicted in the geographer, and Faith rests her foot on the continent of Asia, which has encouraged many varied interpretations. On the floor lies a bitten apple, connoting sin. The twisted serpent has been crushed by a stone, and blood gushes from its mouth, 
symbolizing the triumph of good over evil. The Previous Masterpiece The art of painting clearly served as a prototype for allegory of faith, which was most likely commissioned by a Catholic admirer of the earlier work. Both paintings are set in the same room with very similar decorations. Ironically, not long after Vermeer's death, Allegory of Faith was acquired by a Protestant collector, the banker Hermann van Swole, although originally intended for a Catholic patron. The guitar player. In this painting, Vermeer depicts a young girl strumming a guitar. The instrument is placed comfortably on her lap while she plays near a window, sitting in the corner of a room. Her attire is made up of an ermine bordered yellow jacket, an ivory colored satin dress, and a pearl necklace. Surrounding her is a painted pastoral landscape bordered by an extravagant picture frame, a blank wall, three books, and a guitar. Prior to this painting, Vermeer portrayed individuals with obscure expressions. On the contrary, this young girl has an open expression that is joyous and flirtatious. The girl's smile and tipped head, along with the fixed gaze on something just outside the painting, suggests that she is playing not for us, but for an unseen individual. Her dress and hairstyle reflect the relevant fashions of the wealthy Dutch in that day. The young girl is portrayed with wholesome features and a free expression, as if she is in the act of speaking or singing. The joyous demeanor established in this painting is conveyed through the young girl's self-expression, the peaceful landscape pictured behind her, and the soft tones of light and dark. Due to these factors, Vermeer is able to provoke feelings of calmness and contentment. Dated circa 1672, this work of art is one of Vermeer's final artistic activities, providing insight into the techniques he mastered and approaches to painting he favoured. The painting has been on display at Kenwood House, London, since the 1920s as part of the Iver Bequest collection. After being recovered from a theft in 1974, when the painting was held for ransom, the guitar player was returned to Kenwood House. The morning jacket portrayed in this painting resembles five separate Vermeer paintings, three of which are a lady writing a letter, mistress and maid, and woman with a pearl necklace. In each painting, the jacket depicts different types of folds, distribution of spots, and fur trim. The thin patches of grey and yellow lead tin paint categorize the abstract pattern that establishes the folds in the jacket's fabric and fur trim. Vermeer's devotion to painting light and shade can be acknowledged through the inclusion of dark brown shadows painted on the young musician's right arm and shoulder. From a distance, these small patches seem blended, but they are actually laying side by side. Historians conclude that the fur on Vermeer's morning jacket was not made from ermine, but either cat, squirrel, or mouse. The fur was then decorated with faux spots. The jacket in the guitar player is one of the few surviving examples of 17th century overcoats. Vermeer's depiction of a pearl necklace alludes to the young girl's elegant lifestyle. In this work, he used an abstract technique to portray the pearl necklace, which was replicated his painting, Allegory of Faith. To begin, he painted a base layer of dark greenish-gray, 
that curved around her neck to depict a shadow. Over the shadow, he created a hazy sequence of white spherical highlights. He did not define the individual pearls to portray the natural translucence of the gemstone. Compared to his paintings of the mid-1660s, Vermeer simplified and dismissed intense detail for abstracted portrayals. This shows an outgrowth of his own style, along with a technique that was not frequented by artists of his time. Vermeer's depiction of a young girl making music is associated with the nobility found in artistic inspiration, as well as the art of painting in the 17th century. The guitar originated in Spain and was keenly sought after in the Dutch Republic. Compared to the lute, the guitar was cheaper and easier to play. This instrument has been decorated with a combination of ivory, ebony, tortoiseshell and mother of pearl. The sound hole is created with multiple layers of ornately scrolled paper. In the 17th century, the guitar was used as both a continuo, harmonic instrument and a solo instrument. The music the guitar produces is bolder than that of the lute, and this is due to the design of the chords. The guitar's strings reverberate deeper and fuller than that of past instruments. It does not play as loud as the modern flamenco guitar, and the gut strings are played with fingers. This painting depicts a five-course guitar, which was standard for most solo musicians. Vermeer's depiction of a guitar suggests a move into the modern world of music, in which the lute is left behind with its contemplative and conservative traditions. The depiction of this guitar was created with immense attention to detail. The sound hole is created with a depiction of a finely tooled gold rose, where Vermeer has created an abstract arrangement of painted strokes. These strokes are highlighted with hazy accents of lead-tin yellow paint. The decorative white and black trim of the guitar's border intensifies the painting's cheerful atmosphere. The small detailed sound hole was created with blobs of impasto paint, which portrays the light reflecting across its slick, uneven surface. The most influential and well-thought-out technique Vermeer used in this painting focuses on the guitar's strings. Some of the strings are blurred. This suggests that they have been strummed and are vibrating. Because of this, we can assume she is in the midst of playing a song. Vermeer's picture within a picture was identified by art historian Gregor Weber. The landscape that is depicted behind the young girl's head is identified with Peter Janssens, a wooded landscape with a gentleman and dogs in the foreground. In Vermeer's version, the mimicked composition is cropped slightly on top and on the right. The head of the young musician covers the gentleman and dogs. Vermeer's version guides the viewer's focus towards the centered tree, as well as incorporating blue skies and greener foliage. Vermeer may have incorporated this sun-filled pastoral landscape into his painting in reference to woman's beauty. Artists in the 17th century were often attributing the topic of female beauty to nature, which was frequently expressed through poetry and music. Vermeer's depiction of a whitewashed wall allowed him to set the stage for a scene that illustrates an individual strumming a guitar composed on the left side of the canvas. The painting's composition is balanced due to the large negative space the wall creates. The unobtrusive wall helps establish the mood of the painting as well as the lighting scheme and spatial depth. Because of the wall's color, Vermeer was able to establish a warm and welcoming temperature from the incoming light. Vermeer's brushwork also implies the light's direction. According to the Delft building historian Wim Weave, the use of whitewashed walls was frequently integrated in the houses, castles and churches of the Dutch in the Middle Ages. The beginning process of whitewashing a wall starts with a thick application of lime putty, which is created with burned seashells. When the putty dries and the wall is thick enough, then the process of whitewashing with paint can begin. 
Although unrecognizable to the untrained eye, this wooden chair is portrayed several times through Vermeer's artistic career. At the top left-hand side of the painting, behind her shoulder, a silhouette of a lion-head finial can be found. This finial references chairs designed and crafted by the Spanish. When constructing this chair, the Spanish craftsmen used leather and not cloth. This is due to Spain's constant supply of rawhide. These chairs were respected for their craftsmanship and creativity, and the creators of these chairs regarded themselves as superior within the craftsmen guilds. Vermeer's decision to depict three books suggests the young girl's sophistication, which is implied through a high level of education. Even though scholars do not know the book titles, it has been argued that the middle book's bulkiness resembles the Bible, and it has been stated that the possible representation of the Bible implies biblical advice. If this is true, then the painting could indicate a decision to morally ignore the religious text. The young girl's body language and facial expression turn away from the book to pay attention to the individual on her right. Others argue that the presence of the book implies learning, which is familiar in Dutch paintings of the Middle Ages. According to scholar Elise Goodman, the young musician featured in this painting would be a member of the haute bourgeoisie who could read, write and speak several languages. Vermeer's artistic style in the 1670s is often compared to his earlier style of the mid-1660s. The guitar player properly demonstrates the energy of Vermeer's late style. His earlier paintings portray quiet, self-contained worlds, but the guitar player is different. His late style demonstrated abstract painting techniques, in which the depiction of motion is portrayed through the diffused illustration of shifting objects. With Vermeer's experience, he began to create paintings that demonstrate dynamic poses and actions, implying that a movement, or in this case, sound, is taking place. The guitar player is often compared to Vermeer's Woman with a Lute. This is another painting by Vermeer which was later stolen, this time from Kenwood House on 23rd of February 1974, by supporters of the IRA. Fortunately, ten weeks later, it was recovered in a churchyard in Smithfield, London. Lady Standing at a Virginal this painting is now housed in the National Gallery London and depicts a young woman playing the virginal. Looking directly at the viewer, she seems to recognize someone who has just entered the room, and she smiles at them. On the virginal's lid, a landscape can he seen, and there is also a small landscape picture hanging on the wall in the style of Jan Wynant's. The large picture of Cupid is thought to have been inspired by an engraved emblematic image by Otto van Veen. Cupid holds a card showing the number one or an ace, which was a symbol of fidelity.
Lady Seated at a Virginal, also housed in the National Gallery London, this work is most likely Vermeer's last surviving painting, which may have been inspired by Gerard Doe's woman playing the virginal, completed a few years earlier in 1665. The painting depicts a young woman sitting at a virginal, who turns to the viewer with a mysterious look. The painting on the back wall is the Procurus by Van Baberen, which was depicted earlier in the concert. Van Baburen's painting symbolizes mercenary love, which contrasts with the faithful love of Cupid represented in the previous Vermeer painting, A Lady Standing at the Virginal. Many critics believe that both of these Vermeer works were pendants, as they are almost identical in size. After Vermeer's death, the two paintings were separated, and it was only in 1867 that they were reunited by the critic Torre. Once more they were separated in 1892, when Lady Standing at the Virginal was bought by the National Gallery, but the other painting was then acquired by George Salting, who bequeathed it to the National Gallery in 1910. Since then, both pictures, which represent the last of Vermeer's works, hang together in the gallery. A young woman seated at the Virginals. This disputed work is housed in a private collection in New York. The painting is thought to date from circa 1672. Until recently the work was little known, but it was determined to be a Vermeer painting through technical examination and passages of painting very similar to those in Vermeer's Lady Seated at a Virginal. According to the technical analysis performed by the special committee that studied the work, telltale signs of ultramarine blue were discovered in the light grey colour of the wall. It is well known that Vermeer used this pigment extensively in his oeuvre, providing further evidence that the painting is by the Delft master. The last three years of Vermeer's life were filled with hardship following the 1672 invasion of the Dutch Republic by the French, German and British armies. This led to a dramatic economic crash for the once prosperous middle-class country. The art market plummeted and Vermeer could barely afford to keep himself, his wife, her mother and his eleven children. He took on increasing amounts of debt, borrowing thousands of guilders and was even caught pocketing his mother-in-law's money. Vermeer died on December 16, 1675, having fallen into a fit of madness and depression. In the court records, his wife stated that, during the ruinous war with France, he not only was unable to sell any of his art, but also, to his great detriment, was left sitting with the paintings of other masters that he was dealing in. As a result, and owing to the great burden of his children having no means of his own, he lapsed into such decay and decadence, which he had so taken to heart, that as if he had fallen into a frenzy, in a day and a half he went from being healthy to being dead. Due to the very localized fame during his lifetime, Vermeer seemed to disappear from the art world until the 19th century, when French artists in the manner of Edouard Manet started to turn their eyes toward the real and unpretentious. Since Vermeer had been so adept at capturing moments of ordinary beauty, he became a major influence on these artists, 
who revived an awareness of the Master's work. Despite the fact that only thirty-four, three more are disputed Vermeer's, of his pieces have survived, Vermeer is considered today to be one of the greatest artists of the Dutch Golden Age. In the twentieth century, the surrealist Salvador Dali became entranced by Vermeer's work and produced his own variations including The Ghost of Vermeer of Delft, which can be used as a table in 1934, as well as The Lacemaker, after Vermeer, in 1955. Other artists like the Danish painter Wilhelm Hammershoi adapted Vermeer's calm domestic interiors for their own 19th and 20th century subjects. Hammershoi has modernized Vermeer's Woman in Blue, reading a letter by reversing the image and subduing the color palette so that it almost feels the audience is looking at an early photograph of a domestic Danish interior. Among many of his exalted paintings, Girl with a Pearl Earring is considered the Mona Lisa of the North. Its staggering realism and emotional ambiguity has inspired artists, novelists and filmmakers for decades. Most recently, the anonymous British graffiti artist Banksy reinterpreted and reproduced the painting on a building in Bristol, UK, using a burglar alarm in place of the iconic pearl earring.